بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, good afternoon everyone thanks for uh, uh, joining us in the subspecialty lecture today I'm sorry I just ran out uh, from OR uh, I just finished surgery uh, so sorry for the delay but inshallah we will try to make it on time my name is Hattan Khayari today we're talking about orbital tumors uh, previously a couple of years back we used I used to present this lecture in two parts but um, uh, this year we uh, elected to make it one. The first presentation actually, or part one was presented by Dr. Hind Gappan a couple of months back, but uh, was mainly concerned with the histopathological diagnosis of orbital tumors. Uh, today, we're gonna discuss clinical aspects. <clears throat> uh, so this is the outline of the, uh, uh, today's lecture. I'm gonna uh, just give one, ex one or two examples of each uh, entity here, uh, congenital tumors, vascular tumors, uh, mesenchymal tumors, lacrimal gland uh, tumors, neurogenic lymphoproliferative secondary and uh, metastatic tumors. Before we uh, jump to the, sorry. Uh, so, so before we jump to diseases, uh, I'll just remind myself and the audience about the importance of the history. Uh, history is very important in this um, uh, topic uh, as the duration and the progression will give you a good hint about the, a good differential diagnosis. So uh, things that happen over hours are usually related to hemorrhage. Things related uh, happen happens or progress over days are usually uh, infection or uh, acute rapid inflammation. Uh, weeks to months are usually uh, inflammatory or tumors, and those in years are low-grade inflammation uh, or uh, tumors as well. Uh, medical history is important for you to uh, obtain from the patient and ask the patient for previous photo. These are the six, the famous six Ps that you know for orbital diseases. Uh, pain, proptosis, progression, palpation, pulsation, and periorbital changes. We call it the six Ps of the orbital uh, uh, diseases. Uh, of course, they are very important. And all the time, if you have an orbital case, try to uh, go through them and mention them in the history and the exam. However, they're not uh, enough. Of course, you need to do exothalmometry, extraocular muscle movement, check the optic nerve function, do visual field. And if you're thinking about tumors, always try to palpate the uh, lymph nodes over the submandibular, submandibular or the cervical area. And check for paresthesia for um, uh, affection of the periorbital nerves. The uh, imaging are very important in, in this subject, of course. Uh, the first example we're gonna put here is, um, uh, is a congenital one, uh, where uh, dermoid cyst is usually congenital chorosoma. Uh, it could be superficial or deep. Uh, the dermoid, the, the, the way that we uh, uh, differentiate, we differentiate between the dermoid and the epidermoid is only histopathologically. Otherwise, clinically, they, they look the same. Uh, histopathologically, the only difference is the presence of dermal appendages or skin appendages. Uh, for example, skin and gland or um, sweat gland or sometimes teeth. Uh, the epidermoid usually is just filled with keratin, but there's no skin appendages. So the differentiation is usually uh, pathological. The, um, according to the location of the dermoid, uh, we can differentiate it into superficial or uh, deep. Uh, superficial, superficial like this young five-year-old uh, uh, girl who had this mass was growing over uh, the previous couple of years. Now, of course, as you remember, dermoids just uh, happen because uh, uh, skin gets trapped between uh, the bony sutures when closure happened during the intrauterine life. And after that, after that uh, entrapment of the uh, fold of the skin, it starts to fold open itself and causes a uh, cyst. Most commonly, uh, it happens to be uh, temporally where the frontozygomatic suture is involved or sometimes uh, superior nasally, like this case in which the frontoethmoidal suture is involved. So usually it's painless, no inflammation, it's a palpable mass, usually firm in consistency, at in, in large slowly over months and years. And it's usually fixed to the bone, so it's not freely mobile. We do imaging here to make sure of the diagnosis first, to rule out posterior extension, and uh, to exclude other uh, more serious diagnoses. 
Uh, surgical removal is the treatment of choice and it's pretty easy. Um, uh, this is an example. This is the same patient I uh, showed previously. However, uh, you should make sure in surgery that you take the whole mass as uh, one block uh, to prevent recurrence or uh, inflammation if uh, ruptured. On the other hand, the uh, orbital dermoid or the deep dermoid uh, usually happen during adolescent or adulthood. And it sometimes give like a vague presentation or it could be of a diagnostic dilemma because it's usually, a give, it gives a non-axial progressive proptosis over years with some globe displacement or dystopia. Um, and if it's close to the temporal area, usually we uh, uh, sometimes get it confused with the lacrimal gland tumors. It may leak spontaneously or sometimes after head trauma, which cause an orbital inflammation that can mimic orbital cellulitis. But again, when you image the patient, you make sure that there are no sinusitis. This is a mass and most likely uh, it's a, um, an orbital dermoid radiologically. So depending on the uh, location, if the mass is uh, superior nasally, we think of frontal mucosal, sinus cyst, uh, encephalocele, if it's uh, superior laterally, we think of lacrimal gland uh, tumors. Again, surgical excision as a whole tumor is the main treatment of choice here. This is an example uh, that uh, I've seen this uh, young uh, man, young um, uh, boy, he's almost 12 year old now. Uh, they noticed that he has fullness on his superior sulcus of the right eye, with, and you can see that the whole eye is pushed inferiorly. Uh, that happened over uh, the last two years, according to the family, and was uh, uh, progressive. Uh, on imaging, it's consistent of dermoid cysts, but I'm sharing this case with you because to show you that with the chronic exposure or the chronicity of the disease, it excavates, it excavates the bone, and it, uh, lead, it led to uh, uh, erosion in his uh, superior orbital roof, and there was, there was a communication with the uh, cranium. So uh, the superior orbital roof uh, defect resulted in communication between this mass and the uh, cranial cavity. Um, we'll move now to the uh, uh, vascular tumors. Capillary hemangioma is very common. You will see this definitely during your uh, career. You will see it during your residency for sure. It's the most common benign orbital tumor of childhood. It's a hematoma and it usually does not present uh, immediately after birth. Uh, however, it starts usually in the first or second month of life. Um, and then it has like a progressive course of enlargement that takes uh, almost like a year and a half. And then it starts like regression with time. Uh, classically, books say that 75% um, uh, will resolve within seven years. It has so many different presentation. So uh, from a... Uh, a superficial um, uh, hematoma that you can see involving the skin and the muscle and the lid that usually increases in size when crying, uh, when the baby cries, or a deep orbital lesion that has no skin manifestation. Again, it increases with pressure or when the patient or the baby is crying. It could be of uh, uh, yellowish or, uh, sorry, bluish or uh, reddish uh, discoloration and may involve the um, uh, may involve the conjunctiva or the deep uh, sutures or the deep uh, structure of the muscle, I'm sorry. It might be associated with a dermal or visceral uh, hemangiomas in the head and neck area. Uh, it might be associated with the Kazabach Merit syndrome, uh, which we don't see usually in the orbital uh, cases. Usually those um, cases happen in the visceral or the very big uh, hemangioma in which bleeding happened inside the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, hemangioma and it results in a quick, fast depletion of clotting factors and thrombocytopenia because of an inside bleeding in the, um, uh, in, in the visceral, uh, visceral hemangioma itself. It could be associated with face syndrome like this, like this patient. Uh, huge facial hemangioma involving also the uh, 
involving the uh, sorry the bar was uh, covering this uh, involving also the brain as well as the neck area so cerebral hemangioma as well uh, and neck uh, hemangioma and some other uh, visceral hemangiomas The indication for treatment usually is uh, ambulopia that is caused by ptosis, uh, astigmatism, or an isometropia, um, uh, strabismus, or exposure keratopathy. Uh, optic nerve compression sometimes um, happen with deep orbital uh, lesions. For management of, uh, of capillary hemangiomas, uh, we usually start propanolol, systemic propanolol. You can give up to three milligram per kg per day, but you should observe for side effects like uh, bradycardia or hypotension. Um, it gives a great uh, uh, response, uh, systemic uh, propanolol. So nowadays, this is the treatment of choice. Back, back then, on during my residency, we did not know about propanolol. We used to inject steroids. So we take the patient to OR, we inject steroid of a mixture between uh, trimsolone and vitamethasone, and we bring the patient every three months to inject uh, steroids that will cause shrinkage of the mass. However, uh, problems with the uh, steroid injection are um, a lot, including skin necrosis, uh, fat atrophy, fat atrophy, and the most fearful uh, complication is the central retinal artery occlusion, which has been already reported in the literature, literature because of a retrograde, um, um, retrograde migration of the um, uh, material or the uh, steroid uh, itself that usually result in, that usually result in optic nerve uh, oh, sorry, central artery occlusion. Uh, the other issues are uh, you're not quite sure when you're injecting uh, in the uh, orbit that you are already in the orbital, uh, in the deep orbital um, uh, tissue. Systemic steroid, however, can be used if you don't have propanolol or uh, um, uh, injection of steroid. You can give up to one to two milligram per kg per day, but the most uh, reported. Um, uh, Side effect here is growth retardation because in kids it affects growth and rebound phenomena is common. Of course, many other um, uh, entities were used in the past, but they're not quite popular nowadays, like um, interferon alpha. Sometimes we, uh, we do surgery, but again, believe me, it's a nightmare. You cannot get rid of the whole thing. Previously, they used or they tried radiotherapy and embolization. So this is a, um, uh, an example of um, a uh, child with a, a hemangioma. So this is two months of open presentation. This is two weeks after starting the propanolol, and this is in six months post-treatment. Of course, we usually continue to use the propanolol in the first two years of life until the patient starts the regression or the regressive uh, phase, which is the natural history of the disease. Uh, lymphangioma or lymphohemangioma is another vascular orbital tumor that affect the uh, orbit. Uh, usually it's um, a disease of uh, the pediatric age group or um, uh, early adolescent. Uh, however, ad adults can be affected too. Uh, classically, it, it enlarges in, during the uh, upper star tract infection. Uh, it, it, it's usually a vascular malformation that is composed of both venous malformation and lymphatic malformation uh, as well. And it could involve any tissue, conjunctiva, lid, orbit, sinus, or even pharynx. And upon the presentation or the location, it might have variable presentations. The important one you need to know here that sometimes they bleed inside the lymphangioma. Bleeding happens inside the lymphangioma itself, which causes uh, the famous or the uh, typical classical chocolate cyst, in which uh, sudden pain and proptosis happen and frozen glow that may lead to progressive optic uh, neuropathy or even exposure keratopathy because of the proptosis. Prognosis is variable, however, it's not favorable as recurrent attacks of bleeding and continuous growth of the tumor usually uh, 
uh, evolve and usually continues. So this is a superficial lymphangioma of the conjunctiva, of the conjunctiva and lid. You can see it. This is a child. So you can see the lid margin and the conjunctiva is full with the lymphangiomas. Uh, or the lymphangioma can be, uh, can be deep. So uh, I remember this patient from during my fellowship. She presented to ER within um, hours of severe pain. And the family noticed the proptosis, the swelling, and the patient cannot open the eye. Now, even when we tried to open the eye forcefully with our hands, even we could not open the, uh, the we could not see the eye because there was a huge lymphangioma on imaging and it got blood inside the, the lymphangioma, uh, which caused the classical chocolate cyst. So the, the chocolate cyst, and the mass was pushing the globe all over superiorly against the orbital roof. You can see how bad and how uh, uh, significant is the globe compressed um, uh, against the bony orbit. Management is usually very difficult to eradicate. We, cons we usually, sorry. We usually uh, manage the, these patients by a uh, conservative uh, treatment. Uh, steroid is not uh, effective. Uh, if the patient came with hemorrhage, like the next patient that I will share with you, um, regression is common. If there is optic neuropathy or ulceration because of exposure, we usually go ahead and aspirate the, um, the, cyst, the, uh, the uh, hemorrhage or the chocolate cyst. Steroid is not effective. Surgery is a nightmare. It's difficult. Complete resection is often impossible. Recurrence is high. And when we go, when we dare and go and, uh, to remove lymphangiomas, you should be uh, ready with uh, different weapons. CO2 laser, cautery, fibrin glue to prevent or to decrease the bleeding. Uh, previously, or in the previous couple of years, OK injection, OK 432 sclerotherapy injection was used. But more commonly nowadays, people are using interregional injection of bleomycin. And at the university hospital, uh, we have a good experience of this um, through Dr. Uh, Professor Yasser al uh, He has a couple of patients that responded very nicely and very well to um, the injection of. We put a drain uh, to prevent uh, recurrence of bleeding. And this is her picture after three days uh, from surgery. Sometimes we don't go and do surgery and do injection, do, do incisions. Uh, this is an eight-year-old uh, girl who uh, reported um, severe proptosis pain and uh, lip swelling that happened two days back after a parasparo tract infection. Uh, this, is, this was not the first presentation of her. So we knew that she had lymphangioma. Uh, you can see because of the chronicity uh, and because she was from outside the Yelp. <clears throat> By the time she came here, um, you can see the huge chemosis and the ulceration of the conjunctiva and as well as the exposure keratopathy, the corneal scarring started to happen inferiorly. The same day we took the patient um, after a careful studying of her images, and we just passed a large needle with a um, syringe and we aspirated a good amount of blood from that chocolate cyst. Immediately you can see the eye and the globe um, relieved from that tension. And this is her picture after nine months from that incident. Um, cavernous hemangioma, on the other hand, is usually a, a, a benign orbital tumor, and it is the most common benign orbital lesion or uh, tumor in uh, adults. In a lot of time, you will, uh, the patient will be asymptomatic, like this patient. He's smiling, as you can see. He had no symptoms of whatsoever. Uh, he, he did the um, imaging for his sinuses, and the, the radiologist discovered that he has a mass in his orbit, and he referred him. Usually the mass is intraconal, but can be extraconal as well. Uh, female are more affected than uh, male. Classically, uh, it happens at third or fourth decade of life, and it's uh, slowly it gives a slowly progressive axial proptosis. Of course, with time, 
uh, uh, loss of vision or decreased vision happens because of the choroidal folds, hyperopia, or disc edema, and it's usually within the muscle cone, so it's intraconal. As you can see, it is usually well encapsulated mass that is homogeneous. It depends on the case. Sometimes we observe, but in a lot of times we take the patient for surgery, in which do we do <clears throat> lateral orbitotomy and excision of the mass, which is usually uh, pretty acceptably uh, easy. This is a patient uh, courtesy of Dr. Uh, Professor Sahibani. So the patient noticed, so this patient was noticed to have uh, proptosis in his uh, left eye and he started to report drop of vision. And you can see that he had disc edema as well and tortuous vessels on his fundus exam. Imaging showed a huge intraconal mass that was uh, uh, most likely consistent with uh, cavernous hemangioma. And as you can see, it was compressing the optic nerve. So immediately so the patient was uh, booked for surgery. Um, we do usually lateral orbitotomy and dissection around this mass is fairly uh, easy. Sometimes we put sutures over the mass and start like uh, pulling it. Uh, or uh, better, if you have a cryotherapy, you can use the cryo to get hold of the mass and remove it completely. The next uh, example is an example of a mesenchymal tumor, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma is the most common primary malignant orbital tumor of childhood. Uh, it usually at, it arises in the first decade, but can happen at any age. It arises from any mesenchymal tissue within the orbit, so it does not mean muscle itself. It gives a subacute sudden progressive proptosis over weeks to months. So the prog again, the progression and the history is important when I uh, mentioned this earlier in the uh, presentation. Sometimes may cause orbital inflammation like edema and chemosis or chemosis, uh, or may have a palpable mass uh, can and it can mimic any orbital disease. So it's a uh, it's a good mimicker. This nine year old uh, boy he presented to the emergency room uh, at, at King Abdul Aziz University Hospital after his family noticed that he has a fullness or a swelling in his superior sulcus here. But they related this to um, uh, injury or to fall down during two days back when he was playing football. So he fell down in school while playing football. We examined the patient. Definitely this is not related to, as there was a pulpal mass, it's definitely not related to the uh, injury. Uh, imaging showed a well-circumscribed mass in the superior orbit that was pushing the eye um, uh, in uh, that the patient was pushing the eye inferiorly. We convinced the family that this must be biopsy, should be biopsied. We took him to OR, uh, a lid crease incision was made and we identified the mass. Uh, biopsy was taken and it was sent to uh, histopathology and they confirmed the um, uh, diagnosis of rhabdomyosarcoma. Of course, the patient was referred for uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy by a pediatric oncologist. I will not go through this because I believe Dr. Hinda Tang discussed this previously in her lecture. However, you ju just need to know that the most common uh, rhabdomyosarcoma is the embryonal, and the best one in prognosis is usually the pleomorphic. It can metastasize the eye. This is, again, a child that presented with a mass and fullness in the superior sulcus, causing mechanical ptosis, as you can see. So he had a huge mass in his orbit. Biopsy was taken, it confirmed rhabdomyosarcoma. You can see this is his uh, picture before uh, surgery, and this is two months, sorry, uh, not surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. This is his like, uh, picture after two months of chemo and radiotherapy. You can see that the eye uh, is almost free of disease now. There is no more swelling, there is no more proptosis or dystopia. And of course, he lost his nice hair because of chemotherapy. Um, uh, so our role here is to do uh, is to reach the diagnosis. So urgent biopsy is needed, and then um, systemic workup, um, uh, body imaging, and chemotherapy and radiotherapy are usually done by the uh, pediatric oncologist. Of course, exenteration may be needed for recurrent tumors or for resist, uh, radioresistant cases. If you catch this early, 
this patient usually this patient have usually good prognosis. Uh, next is the lacrimal gland tumors. So in lacrimal gland tumors, we classically say that 50% are epithelial and 50% are non-epithelial. Uh, to make it easy, the non-epithelial are usually lymphomas, which we will discuss later. The epithelial tumors, 50% are benign, and the most common one is the pleomorphic adenoma or the benign mixed tumor. And 50% are malignant, and the classical presentation or the classical example of that is a you know, cystic carcinoma. Pleomorphic adenoma, the old name, pleomorphic adenoma or the benign mixed tumor of lacrimal gland uh, is very common uh, among lacrimal gland tumors. It usually happens in the, between the third to fifth decade and it causes a painless mass that is slowly progressive over years. So the patient will tell you that I had this swelling or this proptosis, or in a lot of time, the patient will have inferior medial globe displacement or dystopia. But because this is benign, there is usually no pain. There is usually no inflammatory signs. There is no redness, no swelling, no pain, because this is benign. And we will see now why. And again, the history is usually over years. So classically over one year. Uh, on imaging, you can see that this lacrimal gland tumor or the pleomorphic adenoma has a definable pseudocapsule. So that's why it is contained within this pseudocapsule. It gives a well-defined circumscribed mass that has a nodular configuration, but there is no bone erosion usually. Treatment usually is complete surgical uh, removal with an intact capsule. We try not to rupture the capsule or incise it as recurrence may uh, happen. And when recurrence happen after the benign, uh, benign mixed tumor or pneumorphic adenoma, usually it's a malignant in the malignant form. So malignant mixed tumor uh, arises from after a long standing or a recurrence or after incomplete excision of pneumorphic adenoma that happened many years back. And of course, as you could imagine, it carries a bad uh, prognosis. Usually, exenteration is needed here. So to reach or to do surgery for um, to remove the pleomorphic adenoma, definitely you need to do lateral orbitotomy. So this is the lateral orbitum uh, rim you can see. This is the saw. So uh, we uh, cut the bone here. We do two cuts. We remove the bone. And then we can we will be able to reach the lacrimal uh, gland fossa and the lacrimal gland can be identified and removed in one piece. Uh, after that, we put back the, um, the bone, the piece of bone, and uh, you can either suture it or you can put uh, screws. On the other hand, the uh, fearful adenoid cystic carcinoma might be a bad news for the patient as this is usually a killer. So uh, it is the most common malignant epithelial lacrimal gland tumors. Uh, Alhamdulillah, thanks God, we don't see a lot of these here in Saudi Arabia, but in the West it's uh, more common. It has a bimodal presentation. So either in the second decade of life or fourth decade of life, and still we don't know why. Uh, but because of the uh, uh, aggressiveness and the um, uh, malignant um, uh, tumor, uh, usually these, those patients, they usually come with aggressive uh, lid swelling, proptosis, dystopia, pain, and redness. So inflammatory, uh, inflammatory signs are usually present. So you can see the lid edema, the chemosis, the redness, the um, edema as well inferiorly. You can see the eyes pushed inferior uh, medial. And the reason for pain, because of the malignancy, malignant tumor usually it invades the bone and causes bony destruction, as you can see here in the imaging. So this, this, this is one of the signs that the radiologists usually uh, use to make sure or to uh, give us like a hint that this could be a malignant. And um, because this tumor lack a true or a pseudo capsule, so it starts enlarging to the posterior orbit. So it, so it travels all the way, it travels all the way through the lateral orbital rim until sometimes it reaches the apex 
and you can see two examples here. Calcification is common in this tumor, and you can see the uh, presentation is not uh, usually uh, in a worse circumscribed mass. No, it takes all the way to the uh, orbit because it um, lacks a, a capsule. Uh, it carries a poor prognosis for the patient. Mostly they die because of brain or lung metastasis or local recurrence. Um, treatment is controversial. Um, some people, um, the best maybe a way for, and the best maybe survival for the patient is to start the patient on uh, systemic and uh, aggressive intra-arterial, intra-arterial chemotherapy through the ophthalmic uh, so through the lacrimal uh, uh, artery, uh, then that, uh, so intra-arterial chemotherapy reduction followed by exenteration chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy. So this is uh, another patient of uh, courtesy of Dr. Professor Sahibani. This young girl, and again, remember my dear uh, residents that this tumor has a bimodal uh, presentation in the second or fourth uh, decade. She came with pain, lid swelling, uh, 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 periorbital inflammation, as you can see. And on imaging, if you could appreciate the dystopia and the proptosis, uh, um, uh, otherwise you can check here her uh, imaging. The MRI showed a, a heterogeneous mass that is traveling all the way along the lateral orbit and till the um, apex uh, later, again, lateral orbitotomy. Lateral orbitotomy was done. You can see the aggressiveness and the ugly looking of that mass. It was removed, and you can see here some bony e erosion because of the uh, malignant uh, uh, nature of that uh, of that uh, tumor. Of course, later on, the patient ended up with exenteration, and her life was saved uh, from that nasty tumor. <clears throat> Neurogenic tumors, I'll give two examples. The, uh, the first one is the optic nerve glioma, which is usually a pediatric uh, tumor. Uh, and it is, if you want to remember this, always link it to neurofibromatosis type one. It is one of the hallmark or the <clears throat> characteristic features of neurofibromatosis type one. Um, it enlarges uh, fairly over uh, months or years and it causes painless axial uh, slow proptosis. Later on, we can see the uh, decrease in vision, but not from the beginning. The optic atrophy and edema is common only on later stages of the uh, presentation, as you can see. It may have a chiasmal or uh, cranial extension as well. On CT scan, it looks, on imaging, it looks, it gives like a fusiform enlargement, fusiform enlargement of the uh, optic nerve um, that usually has no clear calcification and the enhancement is not usually strong. It has mild to moderate enhancement, but could be globular as this example here. Globular. Um, uh, swelling or globular uh, glioma. And this is a, an example of a chiasmal extension of optic nerve glioma. Treatment is usually difficult and sometimes painful as you need to sacrifice sometimes the, uh, with the vision. Uh, again, it's controversial, should be individualized uh, uh, as per patient. Uh, if the vision is good and the cosmesis is ac acceptable, we usually um, uh, observe. If the vision uh, uh, is lost and the patient had bad cosmesis, then we go ahead and excise it surgically. Uh, if the patient has chemotherapy, uh, if the patient has ex uh, cranial extension or chiasmal extension, definitely they need uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. In general, theoretically speaking, neurofibromatosis is a good, good prognostic factor. So those glioma's related to uh, neurofibromatosis are usually um, better in prognosis. The primary orbital meningioma, however, arises from the optic nerve sheath itself. And this, and thus, 
it causes loss of vision quickly. So the patient will present with the loss of vision, not proptosis. So first is the loss of vision. Later on at the later stage, the proptosis happen. As typically as all meningiomas, it's more common in ladies, and it's usually it happens between the third and fourth decade, like the cranial meningioma. It's really associated with optic nerve, um, with the neurofibromatosis. So in general, it causes unilateral painless loss of vision. So you examine the patient, you will see the optic disc swelling or atrophy, the optociliary shunt, and later on in advanced stages of the disease, the patient may have uh, proptosis. <clears throat> so on CT um, or MRI, you will see a diffused tubular thickening diffused tubular thickening that has a high enhancement with um, contrast and usually is associated with the calcification. Uh, this is an optic uh, uh, nerve atrophy related uh, to primary orbital meningioma. And this is the famous optociliary shunt that we may see in uh, these tumors. Treatment again is uh, as per patient, if there is a reasonable vision and uh, no intracranial extension, we usually we just observe. Um, as all meningiomas, mostly they're responsive or, uh, um, uh, to radiotherapy. So radiotherapy can be, um, if the vision is affected or the progressive, the uh, visual loss is progressive, we refer the patient for uh, radiotherapy. Of course, surgical excision can be a, uh, a choice in uh, resistant cases or in very advanced cases. Lymphoma is one of the tumors that you need to know as the incidence of lymphoma is increasing in generally, systematically, as well as the orbit. So it may represent uh, up to 20% of all orbital tumors and it's usually disease of the elderly, but this is not the, um, uh, the case in, in every case, as it might happen in, in young age group as this 19-year-old uh, uh, lady. Um, and it may have various presentation and it's like, uh, it might uh, give like two, uh, many different um, uh, presentations. Uh, of course, like a third of those patients will give you a history that I had a systemic lymphoma, either I'm being treated from systemic lymphoma nowadays or I had it in the past and I've treated um, from systemic lymphoma. So this lady had a, a classical salmon patch that you, can not see if you don't invert the slit, of course. So she presented with fullness and swelling in the upper lid. When you invert the lid, you will see the salmon patch. Of course, lymphoma can happen anywhere in the orbit. Um, it can happen uh, in the lacrimal gland, in the lacrimal gland, in the fat, in the lacrimal sac. Um, and Usually it does, is not associated with pain or inflammation as it usually molds around the tissue. So it's usually molds around the tissue, but does not infiltrate the uh, tissue. And that's why uh, it has no pain or it's, it's painless usually. So this is what we, I was uh, like referring to that the mass, this is the lacrimal sac, lacrimal gland lymphoma. So the uh, mass, molds around the eye, mold around the eye. It will not cause severe proptosis. It will not cause severe uh, dystopia. You will discover this by a fullness in the eye or in the sulcus. And on imaging, you can see it molding around the tissue. And there is usually no bony destruction. Our role here is to have a high sus, uh, index of suspicion to go ahead and take a biopsy. And then pathologically, sometimes we uh, end up or we have a diagnostic dilemma that is this a malignant lymphoma or a benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. However, this is a pathological uh, dilemma or histopathological dilemma that I will not go through because of lack of time. But we think, we think that it is, it's the same disease, but they are like at two uh, different stages. And I quote this from your manual. I quote this from the American Academy of Ophthalmology Manual. It says, literally, lymphoproliferative disorders may represent a continuum in which its ultimate behavior is difficult to predict. So if your pathology report came to be 
benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. Um, it, it, this does not mean that the patient will not develop orbital lymphoma in the future, and we still believe that this needs treatment. Uh, again, some pathological uh, or histopathological um, uh, information that I'm quite sure Dr. Hengaptan uh, covered in her, uh, her uh, lecture. Uh, just remind yourself uh, or remember that most lymphomas are non-Hodgkin's in the orbit I'm talking. Most lymphomas are non-Hodgkin's and they are B-cell. This is an example of a, a rubbery mass that was felt in the uh, superior orbit and the uh, pathology came to be the uh, lymphoma. We refer usually to oncologists where a systemic workup needs to be done. Uh, radiotherapy is the treatment of choice for orbital uh, lymphoma that is localized to the orbit. Uh, of course, in cases of uh, systemic disease, uh, chemotherapy and radiation uh, should be um, used. Uh, patient should be monitored indefinitely. So we used to, to see the patient every six months in the first couple of years, and then maybe on yearly basis, and we instruct them to come back if they have any uh, symptoms or they notice any um, uh, different um, uh, appearances or any complaints in the eye. Now, the last part of the uh, lecture, uh, I'll, I'll just touch on uh, some secondary tumors. Uh, orbital uh, tumors can, uh, can arise from a secondary tumors that um, may come from the globe, for example. And the famous, most common uh, classical presentation is the retinoblastoma in pediatric age group and the uveal melanoma in adult age group. So unfortunately, this is a neglected uh, pediatric or neglected child who presented with bilateral, uh, very aggressive retinoblastoma. You can see the involvement of both eyes with the tumor. Uh, the chiasmal and the optic nerve uh, extension has happened already, as well as the brain uh, extension. So this is an example of an orbital um, disease that happened from the globe. Uh, the melanoma also is another example. The secondary tumors in the orbit may arise from the lids, especially those situated in the medial canthal area in which they tend to be neglected or sometimes over missed. Uh, or misdiagnosed. Of course, uh, it could be a basal cell carcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma. However, in case of squamous cell carcinoma, the disease will be more aggressive because of the perineural uh, spread and the metastasis as well. Treatment is usually difficult as it may uh, need uh, exenteration to get rid of the whole uh, tumor from the orbit, uh, plus uh, and minus chemo radiotherapy. Uh, prognosis is usually poor, but um, uh, it, it depends on the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, orbital tumors may arise from the sinus or the nasopharynx. Um, these patients usually come to you or um, as a consultation from an ENT colleague. Um, that the patient had a mass and it's already in, uh, invading the orbit and the inferior, the orbital floor is usually destructed. Mostly it's uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, it may arise from any uh, sinus and the patient usually have mostly uh, ENT or nose symptoms rather than uh, eye displacement or uh, disfigurement. Um, the surgery is usually uh, indicated, and the radio, radio surgery, radio uh, uh, radiation is also needed as well. Uh, again, uh, orbital tumors can, may arise also from the brain, and the mostly or the classical example here is the uh, brain meningioma. Sphenoid wing, wing meningioma you will see in, uh, uh, as a secondary tumor of the sphenoid uh, wing. As you know from your anatomy, that the sphenoid wing uh, constitute or represent part of the bony orbit. So hyperstosis of the sphenoid wing uh, and hyperplasia of the uh, tissue may result in proptosis or dystopia of the optic nerve of the, of the eye. Sometimes you even compressive, compressing the optic nerve with gradual loss of vision and slow proptosis. Uh, you can see sometimes even that the tumor is also not growing 
only in the orbit, but it also towards the brain. Surgical debulking is usually done by neurosurgery as complete excision is not possible. That is followed by radiotherapy. The last part uh, in the lecture is the metastatic tumor. Uh, in general, I need you to know that in adults, most metastases happen in the choroid. Most metastatic disease will happen in choroid in adults. In pediatric, metastases usually happen in the orbit. So the classical example of metastatic uh, orbital tumor in pediatric age group is leukemia because it's common and neuroblastoma is uh, also common uh, as well. However, in adults, uh, metastasis may happen in the orbit, but mostly in the choroid, as I mentioned, and it can happen or is from, from anywhere. So neuroblastoma is the uh, most common solid tumor of childhood, and we think it is the second uh, most common orbital malignancy in childhood after rhabdomyosarcoma. So rhabdomyosarcoma first, and then neuroblastoma. If you have a child and you see ecchymosis in the periorbital area, please uh, have a high uh, index of suspicion. Uh, consult, you can do imaging. Often you will find a mass, and usually this mass is not a primary lesion. It usually arises from the sympathetic chain, uh, either from the chest mediastinum or the abdomen or pelvis. And um, it usually secretes homovalinic acid and vinyl mandelic acid in urine. Uh, usually they have good response to chemo or radiotherapy, depends on the um, metastasis or on the uh, presentation and the, uh, the uh, metastasis um, uh, level. Uh, this is a patient uh, courtesy of uh, Dr. Professor Yasser al Faqi. Uh, this nine months old was um, found to have <clears throat> was found to have a huge swelling over her temple that uh, presented over uh, the last 40 days. So she had a huge mass over the temple, lid, brow, and it was, it, if you can see, it's pushing the eye down and out, causing uh, inferior dystopia and proptosis as well. Imaging showed an orbital orbital mass, uh, but that was not only the case as the mass was already involving or invading her brain as well. Uh, Dr. Yasser, Professor Yasser Fati did thankfully um, a, uh, a biopsy of this and it came to be neuroblastoma. The patient well, was sent uh, uh, urgently to pediatric uh, oncologist for treatment. Uh, last but not least is metastatic tumors in adult. It may arise from any region as uh, I mentioned previously. The most common are the lungs, uh, prostate, and breast. Sometimes in quarter of those presentation, it may result in a, to, to be a, the primary presentation. So the, the patient will present with pain, proptosis, inflammation, frozen globe as this patient, you can see. So the, this patient had a, a frozen globe, uh, chemosis, pain, and ecchymosis as well. On imaging, he had metastasis in uh, the orbit and the recti muscle. The biopsy is usually uh, needed if the primary is not known. If the patient is known already, then it's, it depends on the uh, original diagnosis. Uh, we see uh, involvement of the rectal muscles mostly in the orbit uh, in, adult, um, uh, in adults because they are rich in blood supply. So those tumors who uh, invade usually through vascular uh, channels usually will tend to get or to have a preference of the rectal muscles. Usually we discuss with the oncologist. However, if this is metastasis, most likely the patient will need uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or sometimes palliative uh, treatment. That was my last slide, but before I open the floor for the uh, questions, uh, I would like to have the opportunity to invite all of you, my um, uh, fellow colleagues, uh, on uh, our 47th um, uh, annual seminar of the Department of Ophthalmology, King's Road University, which will happen, uh, inshallah, it will take place next Tuesday, the 2nd of November. So next Tuesday, inshallah, there will be no ground. Uh, 
uh, on the other hand, we will have the, the, the uh, Dacryology seminar the, under the name of Dacryology Updates and Debates. It's going to be a virtual symposium. So you can attend wherever you are. It's going to be a one day, and it was granted uh, by five CME hours uh, by the Saudi Commission. Uh, uh, we will have uh, both uh, international speakers and local speakers until next week. Um, uh, I'll see you, inshallah, next week. And we hope that you enjoy uh, our seminar, uh, inshallah. Thank you for listening. Um, I think we have three or four minutes if you need to um, ask me any question. I'll be around. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hattan. Alaikum salam. Do you have a voice, Dr. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Mohamed Al-Amri. Ahlan, Dr. Ahlan, Abu Yazid. How are you? How are you? How are you? Allah is going to give you a long time. Thank you very much for this lecture. I have a question regarding the, 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 the tumor in the orbit of, of a child you, you presented. I think it's optic nerve glioma, isn't it? Uh-huh, yes. Yeah, uh, this case usually it's, it should be referred to the or, or, orbit uh, specialist or to the uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, I'm asking this question because uh, I have two cases in the emergency room and it's actually almost the same as this picture. But then um, at that time, I don't think we have uh, orbit uh, specialist at KCASH for, for a reason or another. So uh, in th this case should go to the neurosurgeon or, or purely to the uh, echoblasty and orbit specifically. Now, the, uh, your question is uh, valid, Dr. Uh, Amri. It uh, depends on the case itself and how much vision do, you, do we still have or do we, the patient still has in that eye. The beauty or the uh, privilege of the neurosurgery that they do craniotomy, so they, can, they have a better view to the superior orbit. And if we still have some useful vision, usually they can resect the whole tumor because they have a better uh, view or a better exposure through a craniotomy. However, uh, we as orbital surgeons, we usually do lateral orbitotomy. Our view is uh, limited, I would say. Um, uh, so we can't, in a lot of time, excise the whole tumor um, uh, and to make sure that there's no more tumor in the orbit. However, uh, we do sometimes uh, these surgery if there's no useful vision in the eye. So if there's no useful vision in the eye, let's say the patient is like no light perception or light perception and he has severe proptosis, we go ahead and excise the orbital tumor or the uh, optic nerve tumor uh, uh, to give the patient some uh, cosmesis and the, uh, usually the uh, globe will, will uh, go back again in the, in the orbit. But if you think that the patient has useful vision, craniotomy is much uh, a better approach for uh, better exposure and to make sure that you don't injure or uh, uh, damage the uh, remaining optic nerve function. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hattan. Al Afro, Dr. Rahman Hassan. Any other questions? Uh, yes, please, can I ask a question, please, Dr. I'm Dr. Abdul Munaim, ophthalmologist at Prince Mansour Military Hospital at Taif. Hiyakallah, Dr. Hiyakallah, One question about lymphoma at lacrimal gland. I think sometimes it makes me difficult. You do a biopsy, but if it is a benign lacrimal gland mixed tumor, it's indicated to do uh, biopsy. Yes. So, uh, how we are differentiated between the parts? And when we, we are uh, you, you take my point. Yes, I think. Hey, oh, doctor, uh, if you remember, usually the imaging is uh, uh, help helps uh, helps us a lot. The imaging of the uh, of the optic nerve of the uh, lacrimal gland. 
let me just. Uh, this is, you know, it's cystic carcinoma. You observe, sure, doctor. Yeah. So the uh, pleomorphic adenoma is usually well-contained, homogeneous, and well-defined and circumscribed because it has a pseudo capsule. Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't need to incise the capsule and take a biopsy. You can incise the whole thing. So before you go, before I go for surgery, I usually have a differential diagnosis that most likely this is a benign mixed tumor or pleomorphic adenoma. However, doctor, in, in cases of lymphoma, you will see that the imaging is usually a mass that is not well defined, that usually molds mold around the, the globe and the lateral orbital mode. So it, it grows all the way or to, towards the posterior um, uh, orbit along the, the lateral orbital wall. Mm -hmm. So the differentiation or the difference uh, uh, radiologically is, is, is there. And then you can plan your surgery according to your differential diagnosis. Thank you, Doctor. Hello.